Well, hi, everyone. And once again, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. We get to interview, well, not interview because it's a conversation, of course, but we get to talk with Chris Chamros, who is the executive chair of the board and CEO of Roadrunner. Ah, Chris, it must be lonely at the top. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, Thank you for having me, Michael, and to keep my company. <laughs> there you go. Well, we're really glad that you're here and um i'm i'm glad that we have a chance to to visit it's been a while in coming i know you've been pretty busy uh we we originally chatted last december but now we get to do it and that's fine so i'm really appreciative of your time and uh this is all about you and talking about being unstoppable and so on and so to start that why don't you tell me a little bit of kind of maybe about the early chris growing up and all that sort of stuff. So uh, little Chris was born in Poland um, behind the, at that time, the Iron Curtain mm. under the socialist regime dominated by the Soviets. Um, and little Chris uh, spent his childhood dreaming um, of playing with real cars and dreaming of having uh, a vehicle, uh, which was a luxurious scarcity back then in yeah. that part of the world. And, um, and, uh, looking through the Disney, um, uh, Disney movies, I learned a lot about Roadrunner. So little that I knew that, uh, 40 years later, Roadrunner will be part of my path. Uh, uh, but that journey has taken me through being um, a farmhand in France, a student in England, uh, uh, a banker in Canada, all the way to be an honest operator in the United States when I finally make my way over to this greatest country on earth. Well, and, and I agree it's the greatest country and um, I, I hope we continue to, to do great things. I know we're working at it and sometimes we all tend to take some missteps, but it all balances in the end. And I think that's one of the neat things about democracy. And I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts about that as opposed to what life was like in the Iron Curtain. I certainly do. And while we do have our uh, challenges here and they are undeniable. Um, the spirit of American people is the force to be reckoned with and one of the most inspirational um, forces I've ever encountered in my life. There's a lot of creativity here and it shows and um, it, it continues to advance and I'm sure that it will. At least that's my belief in the, in the whole system, which is cool. Well, um, so you have been in a variety of countries and I'm sort of curious, having had experience in everything from Poland through France and England and Canada and here, um, how would you come, well, other than the country and the politics, how would you compare life um, in, in those different countries and what did it teach you? I think, listen, every, every country has the unique history and culture and customs, which... Um, augment one's um, life experiences when you have a chance to immerse yourself in, in the local context. And if you do it truthfully and um, not necessarily from a tourist um, vantage point, but as a, as a person who tried to fit into the society and performs, um, you know, a function or role or whatever that may be, I think that, that enriches one's lives. At the end of the day, you know, when you think about history, these were all men and women brave enough to uh, board uh, you know, ships and embark on a voyage to an unknown, who were willing to cut ties with everything they've ever known and the history and legacy and potential prosecution and all those things that may have not uh, been kind to them or they were um, escaping from and come to North America and, and make the United States their home and start fresh. And what I do love about that, uh, the nation that now I call home, is that unstoppable force of entrepreneurialism, resourcefulness, resilience, and that truly burning desire to accomplish something remarkable with, uh, with your life. And, and that's, I've never experienced that anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed since escaping from the World Trade Center back on September 11th. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to travel to a variety of countries and speak. And one of the things that I very much enjoy is experiencing 
different cultures and different attitudes. And sometimes I may not necessarily agree with them, but it isn't about agreement. It's really about understanding and broadening one's horizons and understanding. And I think it's so important to be able to do that, to really understand where various people come from and and how they live and and what they do. And, you know, even in the U.S., it is such a large country that the way you experience life in Florida or uh, West Virginia is different than what we experience in California. And it is not to say that one way is better or worse than another. It's just all part of the same country. And what's wonderful is to see all of it meld together. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's and it's so much fun to be able to do that. Well, you said that you originally learned about Roadrunner a long time ago, and you know, how did that happen, or what what did you learn, or how did you experience Roadrunner years ago? Oh, that that was I was just being a little bit jovial of watching ah. uh, Disney cartoons, and you know, got it. Lily, okay, Pee -pee, uh, Wiley but, Coyote. As I yes. said, oh, there you go, Wiley Coyote. But little did I knew that it would become a, such an important part of my adult life. So, do you find uh, Wiley Coyote creeping up every so often today? We do have. We divided teams uh, uh, between Wiley Coyotes and Roadrunners, uh, and and we have a contest and and a very healthy rivalry going between uh, the two groups. And uh, but it is you know it is nice to have something that is so embedded in in the industry culture and the name is so well known and and uh, we're finding and I think we found a way back to. The original glory days of, of the beginning and the excitement and that kind of youthful um, um, youthful um, excitement about our brand, which is a delight to me right now. I suppose one of the advantages of watching Roadrunner years ago in another country is that since it was really a cartoon with very little, if any, talking, it was easy to show without having to worry about translators. Um, that's just, true, but there's there's a lot of lessons from that, Michael. Think about oh, it. sure. The, that that little that little bugger was resilient, and oh, uh, he was absolutely. And, so the, and uh, there's there's a lot of valuable lessons to never let um, never let uh, the circumstances get you down, and always find a way to come back on top. And no matter which Acme company Wiley Coyote went to to get something, it never worked. Correct. <laughs> I was in Montreal once and turned on the TV. It was late morning. And there I was listening to the Flintstones in French, which didn't help me a lot, not speaking French. But it was fun to to know that the Flintstones are in, in different languages. Yeah, that's true. Our chief operating officer hey, is from Montreal, and he's now obviously stateside. But um, there's in an, and, and now... We've, since we've opened service to the the French province of Canada, we maintain those links, and it's very interesting when we encounter French language in our daily emails and communications. It just uh, it gives us the uh, the indication of the the, the vastness of the culture and, and the customs across even this North American continent that we share, which is really cool. I was in British Columbia. In early October of 2001, I had been invited up to speak because people heard about my story, and I went to a guide dog organization that asked me to come and speak. And we got there on Saturday, and the next day we were down in the hotel uh, restaurant having breakfast when the news hit the TV screens that the United States had invaded Afghanistan. What a strange feeling to be not only away from home, but in a foreign country when our country was responding as they did and, uh, and invaded Afghanistan because of September 11th. It was, it was a strange feeling, but at the same time, people were so supportive, which was a wonderful feeling. And mostly that was the case. There were a few people who said, well, America got what they deserve, and they were really shut down pretty quickly around Canada. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, it, that was it, a very special time in our shared history. Yeah, yeah, it it was, and uh, it was strange. We when we were at the airport in Newark, getting ready to fly across country to Canada, it was Saturday, and the airport was pretty empty. And as my wife said, 
it's strange to see these 18 year olds with machine guns strapped to their bodies patrolling the airport <laughs> um and uh and nevertheless it it was it was an interesting time yeah well strange to us here is actually a common occurrence in yeah. many places around the globe to see those uh, young men and women patrol airports yeah. and train stations with machine guns ready to be deployed well and as, as my wife said the problem is these kids probably don't even look old enough to know how to really work the gun but uh, i'm sure they did but it was it was an interesting time um and it's unfortunate that we we all had to experience that but that's kind of the nature of the world well tell me a little about roadrunner what it is what it does and so on how you got involved the roadrunner other, other was, than through uh, the wily coyote yeah, that's right but roadrunner originally was built as a metro to metro direct um um, transportation trucking um, service in the sub market referred to as less than truck load, so called the LTL. And what it means is that within, you know, when you see a semi tractor, you know, speeding down on a freeway, hopefully observing the speed limit, um, <laughs> usually um, about 90% of the market, when you look at those, those trucks, they are full truck loads or mm -hmm. referring in industry as truck loads, it's TL. TL and truckload means that all the contents, all the freight contained within the space of that trailer is destined to one shipper. And shipper is the term we use for customers here interchangeably. So LT, the difference of LTL is that within that same trailer, same 53 uh, foot long trailer, you have freight for um, a lot of different shippers. And LTL is the subsegment of the broader trucking dedicated to service those customers who do not have the need or cannot necessarily afford the cost of um, chartering the whole trailer and that, that may not have any specific need to, to for that kind of space and they utilize um, pallet positions within that trailer to transport the freight from uh, point a to point b that accounts for about 10 percent to 20 percent depending on who you talk to of, of the overall market um, and it's and Roadrunner became an expert and a specialist in taking loads directly across the continent. Um, from it started in Milwaukee, in Cudahy, uh, Wisconsin, and shooting loads directly to um, America's Southwest to mm. you know and and back. That's obviously was linked to the port activity and intake in um, intake freight input point from Los Angeles and Long Beach ports. Uh, but he became an expert and over time the different management teams and different uh, constituency of shareholders embarked on the strategy of growing it uh, across different modes and a lot of things and it became a bit of a problematic story for the last four years we we spend a concerted amount of time and discipline effort to unwind those um those layers and bring it back to the specialist metro to metro long haul um specialist uh, tracking service which has kind of helped us uh, resume our uh, path to um, sustainability and excellence. Is there a lot of competition um, for, well, among LTL companies? I think there's a fair, a fair degree of healthy competition among them. It's, um, it's a fairly um, limited market um, of players. It's, um, I came up through my um, through my experience in LTL. I, I've I've coined this phrase that LTL stands for less than likely to go perfect. <laughs> it's um, you know despite the fact that you think it's a fairly simplistic concept of picking up a pallet in uh, in Philadelphia and delivering it in Dallas, um, it's actually an extraordinarily um, complex and difficult to execute service. And and from a perspective of being on time of of uh, not losing not damaging um, the freight entrusted to you and obviously do it in a in a sort of in a fairly um compressed timeline so it it, it is it is a very specialist way it's, it's very different from uh, what i mentioned about 80 percent of the market which is the track load market which is you know that you know full trailers picked up from pay b they just go to um, to the destination this one is a consolidation play. Um, there's there's different touch points. It's it's, it's a very complex. So uh, while the competition is, is very healthy, 
Um, it's a good competition because it's sort of a tide that raises all the boats. Uh, these are very high quality providers. And uh, as we compete, our customers win. Yeah, which is kind of important. And as long as everybody recognizes that, it makes perfect sense that it, it ought to be that way. Why or what makes Roadrunner kind of unique or what sets it apart from other companies? What it said that we specialize in doing that one thing, which is taking loads directly and connecting uh, a very far apart points across the United States, Canada, and in increasingly Mexico direct. So a lot of um, large, large um, carriers or trucking companies have um, a very densely uh, populated terminals. Um, and they've, you know, they may have in excess of 300 terminals in the United States alone. What they do is um, they like very much like an airline, they created a sophisticated hub and spoke system where the shuttle service connects um, the entire network. So for example, the, the freight from uh, picked up from Long Beach destined to Atlanta may go through five different hubs mm -hmm. um, as, as the, the network is designed the the problem with that is that every time you know you have to go into an ltl trailer that means the forklift drives inside and lifts the pallet needs to take it out then takes the cross the cross dock puts in another trailer that's going to be destined to the next uh, uh, point and stop um, on the way damage happens loss happens um and, and time is wasted and just and time is wasted so what we do is we only have 36 terminals, um, but we, we're in major metro and metro, uh, metro, metro to metro um, connectivity. I always say that if you have a professional sports team, ideally a good one, you, we're going to have a terminal there in those cities. And we use our team drivers and we just, just shoot those loads straight across. So we compress the time uh, that it takes to uh, traverse the, the the distance, and we eliminate those points of rehandling of pallets and freight, and let you know greatly reduce the risk of loss, the risk of damage, etc. And presumably, as part of that, you are very creative in scheduling so that when you take a load somewhere and you get to the final destination, you also have other material to pick up to go back or to go elsewhere so you don't leave trucks idle very often. Correct. So that's that's the art and the, and the science of network design. Yeah. The way we execute it, we obviously have a tremendous amount of data analytics and algorithmic uh, um, tools to help us uh, route this way because at the same time, not just the, 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 tr uh, the, the, the trucks sitting idle, but uh, the drivers don't like you know, drivers like to drive because when they drive, they make money. Yeah. And that's, uh, we are very good at keeping them uh, on the road and making money. So what got you started in deciding to be part of Roadrunner and, and working up through the system to get where you are? Um, you know, I've, over the last uh, two decades, I've, I've become a, a sort of a specialist in unlocking trapped value in logistics companies across all modes of supply chain globally. And Roadrunner was certainly um, one platform with very severe challenges. And, um, and I really loved the story. I was completely taken by the, the strength and, of, and the resilience of its people. Mm -hmm. um, and I really thought it's an incredible opportunity to orchestrate a turnaround like no other in the trucking industry. And while it may sound a little bit um, um, arrogant, it's not meant to be, but um you know as as i've heard it from equity analysts and and uh, bankers many uh, many uh, trucking companies have attempted turnaround and restructuring and very few ever made it um there was a time when old dominion um um uh, road Lewis, which is one of the best mm -hmm. um, arguably the best ltl carrier in the nation um they used to suffer from terrible reputation and I remember they were called or referred to as uh, the old smelly onion. Um, today, it's a gold standard for all of us in this business to aspire to. But there was a time in the 90s when they suffered greatly and they orchestrated a spectacular turnaround. And there were, there were some others as well, but 
uh, Roadrunner in recent history is definitely the most spectacular comeback um, in that space. Well, it it obviously in part has to do with being very creative and figuring out ways to do exactly what you do, which is to get material from one place to another, minimum of any transfer from one truck to another, because you're right, that can cause a lot of damage. And it does take a lot of time. And um, I'm sure that the result of that is that drivers appreciate it as well. Drivers do. Drivers are, you know, hardworking people. It's it's tough to think um, when it, when I do about more a group of of, of bit more patriotic uh, uh, pillars of our society. Uh, drivers are uh, a true American entrepreneurs and. We um, pride ourselves in empowering them and putting them in business and helping them build their own businesses. And we have, you know, so many success stories that filled our hearts with pride. But at the end of the day, drivers stay and drivers support the carrier that helps them make money. That means helps them busy, stay on the road, gives them good loads. And we have become, you know, we've kind of prioritized this as our core competence. So with all of that, how was it during the whole period of COVID? Because, of course, a lot of things happened and a lot of things shut down and a, a lot of things changed because of COVID. How did all that affect Roadrunner and, and what you do and how did you all come out of it? Well, we certainly, we, we kind of started the restructuring and literally uh, at the beginning of March, which, um, you know, was uh, in 2020, which was like two weeks before the entire country shut down. Um, so obviously that made it for a very interesting uh, time in our life. But trucking is such an essential service, it never stops, right? Without trucking, mm -hmm. no nothing gets delivered. You cannot do anything. It's probably next to the sanitation services, I think the most critical part of American or any economy for that matter. And so we worked, we worked interruptedly through the pandemic. Um, we were very focused on rebuilding our business and fixing our operations. So everything that was happening um, external to our business were kind of on, very much in our peripheral vision because we had so much work to fix our business from inside out. And that kind of kept us busy for, for pretty much the next uh, two and a half years. So COVID was kind of a, a good impetus and an excuse to, to do the things that you, you knew you kind of needed to do anyway. Um, it was a good. Uh, it was a good time because we yeah. would have to, have to do it anyway. But uh, the the people were so distracted by obviously the stress of uh, of the situation. It kind of took the focus completely away from what we were, um, what we needed to do. And I think that was a blessing. Several um, weeks ago, I had the opportunity to chat with a gentleman named Glenn Gao, who lives in Northern California, who's a business leader coach and he promotes the whole concept of ai and specifically managers using ai to help create ideas to improve what they do and to improve their companies and so on but one of the discussions we had um and he and he said something very interesting during the discussion but one of the discussions we had was how ai is going to affect people as we go forward and one of his positions was Artificial intelligence and all the things that are going on with AI doesn't eliminate jobs. Uh, rather, people eliminate jobs because either they they find that they can do things cheaper, but they're they're not really doing themselves any good by doing that. Because what AI should really do is, where relevant, help redefine jobs. And one of the things that we talked about was exactly the whole concept of truck drivers when. AI and autonomous vehicles come more into existence, what will happen to truck drivers? And his point was, even if you let a vehicle operate autonomously and it's completely safe, what that really should do is not to require a driver to not be in a truck anymore, but rather you find other responsibilities and other things for the driver to do while monitoring the, the driving of the vehicle no matter how safe it is. And so that, that prompts the question, 
What do you think about the whole issue of autonomous vehicles and AI and where you think that might might go over time? Because I, I tend to agree with Glenn. It shouldn't eliminate jobs. It may cause some expansion or redefining of jobs, but not elimination. Yeah, I, mean, I think, listen, this is a, obviously a topic that could take a day and, and everybody has <laughs> yeah, an opinion. You know, on it. yeah. I always, I always love watching those clips from the news. Um, yeah, uh, news uh, from the 1990s when the first uh, the the internet, the World Wide Web, was introduced, and people kind of speculating with it if it's going to you know mean anything. Or if it's gonna, you want to you, you don't want to be that guy who voices an opinion that gets recorded, and 20 years later your kids get to see it. What you know, what a dumb dumbass your your dad may have been. Um, this is uh, this is one of those. So I I have a very specific view on this. I you know I always kind of think that there are certain uh, tools that I invented that help um, things, and some of them are very useful and don't necessarily make the lives easier. An example for that is a vacuum cleaner. You know when I when I was born, the vacuum cleaner was still a novelty and not particularly um, a widely thing. What was happened that uh, once a year. The entire, entire, entire family would gather to take one or two rugs that, that were present at home, take them outside, you know, clean them, usually in the snow, uh, mm. because that was thing, mm -hmm. and come back and just enjoy the freshness for the next year. Now, the vacuum cleaning comes a genius invention, a genius invention. Yeah. What do we do? You know, if, if, if my mom would have that way, I would be vacuum cleaning every day. <laughs> It's just that instead of a once a year thing, I, I I have a hobby now that every time my mom is upon to one thing, I better get on that and, and get it clean. So did it really save ours? I don't know. But definitely a useful invention. AI broadly, I think, has has a Im immense impact on our lives to the to to the extent that I don't think anybody can even appreciate right now. In terms of the logistics business. I actually think there's very limited impact of what AI can do. And this is a sort of a, and this is very humble opinion um, after, you know, spending the two decades in fixing different um, supply chain businesses. And it's just the unpredictability, the, the, the size of these, you know, statistically viable data samples, um, the, the, the the patterns of different outcomes is just impossible to schedule. And up until you can lift a pallet from Portland and it can traverse in, in Metaverse to Chicago, you still need a truck, you still need a forklift, you still need someone to oversee this. Right. Um, so definitely impact on jobs and logistics, I would say minimum. I think basically maybe quality um, the quality of service, perhaps we're using uh, machine learning and AI algorithmic uh, methodologies in, in, in our static um, load plan, which basically means routing the freight the best possible way. But at the same time, it's not an infinite benefit game. At the end of the day, you have an I-10 corridor and you have a truck that yeah. can traverse the speed limit. And what is the best case? It's just, it's, you, there's very limited outcomes to the upside here. So I think the AI in terms of the, you know, in terms of the logistics space will have probably the most muted effects of, of across the board, if I think about it. And, and definitely, you know, as, as I'm looking forward to the, the marginal benefits, I, I don't see it as a particular needle mover for us here. Well, as I said, even if, you could completely automate a vehicle so that it could drive itself, and that's fine. Um, I still say that ultimately, um, I would never want to remove the driver from the vehicle, but rather give the driver other things to do to help the company. And they're, they're, the creative people will figure that out. And I, I think that there is no way that it should eliminate jobs. It's ridiculous to think that. Um, it's supposed to enhance and I think that there are ways that it will, whether vehicles will really become fully autonomous anytime in the near or intermediate future, at least, is is open to conjecture. But I, I don't like the idea of 
well, it's going to eliminate jobs. I don't believe that that's true. And I think that's what you're saying as well. And it makes sense. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, so in terms of shipping and logistics, what does, um, if you will, shipping and logistics indicate about kind of the broader economy? Because it's certainly, um, listening to what you said earlier, uh, it continued during the pandemic. And I guess that means the economy continues. But in general, just the whole industry, how does that affect or um, fit into the whole issue of the economy and what your industry does for the economy? So, you know, the American economy, every economy has a different mix of drivers, right? The American economy is a consumer driven economy, right? 80% of the GDP is driven by the discretionary consumer spend. So, everything that you and I go and, you know, whether we go to a restaurant or go to the, uh, you know, go to a, a wonderful vacation spot and, and buy it, you know, uh, a plane ticket and then book a hotel. Um, all those kind of things make a difference. Um, and obviously our discretionary shopping habits, that's, that's critical. Um, LTL is very much driven, you know, the entire supply chain accounts for 8% of American GDP. Um, mm -hmm. so it's not insignificant. Um, um, and it is a sort of a barometer of activity. Um, the broader, um, the broader trucking index could be an indication of um, of many drivers in common with this, whether that's industrial out of gauge project driven by infrastructure investments by you know oil and gas sectors or public works or earth moving projects uh, you have all those kind of interactions with ltl is predominantly uh, linked to e-commerce um near shoring um and uh, a little bit to the import activity that um when we have goods imported, they enter the United States, either through the port of New Jersey, New York, or along Beach, um, Los Angeles, and obviously Seattle, Tacoma, or Charleston, and, and Houston, you have all these kind of different entry points, and, um, and we monitor this. So we definitely are continuing to be in a third year of recession, um, or this, you know, the tail end of the second year of recession. A freight recession, that is, um, yeah. where the the volume of shipments has been dramatically muted, dramatically, um, and then we continue to see the excess capacity, the the full truck loads that I spoke about earlier. They hurting the most from the truckers. LTL is a fairly protected niche, and again, e-commerce, which is still alive and healthy, near shoring, um, obviously growing in abundance and significance. That's also helping. Um, and so those, the, the LTL is a little bit insulated from their role and I wouldn't, and it's never particularly good or more reliable, most reliable gauge of, of American economy or its health. Um, the truckload is probably in other modes of trucking are more, uh, indicative, I would say. Um, but again, you know, we can, you know, th this was, you know, what we experienced in 2021 and beginning of 2022, which was unprecedented peak and um, that benefited all people in supply chain. Um, that obviously has been a peak in a cyclical business. And no matter what you call it, the transportation business are commodity businesses and commodity business in cycle. And some of the modes within that sector cycle more violently than others. And, and we are at the trough of that cycle. And um, and probably will be here for quite some time because we see, before we see any meaningful recovery. Why is there such a, a freight recession right now? Um, what has happened is, if you remember that, what, there's a couple of things. So number one, at any cycle, at the peak of the cycle, a lot of people make decisions, and there's this unimpeachable view of self-intellect among them among mm. some of the decision makers who think, okay, this time will be different. And this time we won't let this slip. And there are decisions made at the peak of the cycle that have consequences or carry the consequences through the trough. Those decisions in our industry usually impact capacity, such as the number of new orders for trucks and trailers and terminal expansion. When you, when you look at this, never ever before in the history of mankind, more tractors, trailers, and terminals have been commissioned or ordered 
than there were in 2021 and 2022. Uh -huh. All these orders are now coming in, creating unprecedented capacity. And now, mind you, 2020 and 2021 tested, you know, tested our ability to function without the ability to interact with each other. So you remember, you know, we all remember everybody was stocking up on just about any house good supplies, mm -hmm. you know, toilet paper, Clorox and disinfectants and just about anything. And the volume was just that no matter how much capacity you had, you, you didn't have enough to mm. satisfy the thirst of the consumer back in those days. So people made a lot of decisions. Most profound were those of ocean shippers who commissioned more supermax container ships than ever, ever in the history of the planet. And all these ships are being launched right now in the second or so soon in the second part of 2024. Never before we had such an onslaught of new supply in the ocean, which obviously collapsed the pricing and in a, in an ocean market, and that has a domino effect through you know starts with the ocean because everything comes from China, Indonesia, India, Vietnam. Nothing comes from you know nothing comes from you know. Uh, from the American Midwest anymore to, to meaningful thing. Now, thankfully, that's been offset by those near showing trends and the resurgence of Mexico and, and infrastructure investment in manufacturing on this continent, which is phenomenal. But, you know, you had that, that onslaught of capacity and carried from ocean ships through, through train cars, through tractor trailers, through new terminals. And, you know, they just, you know, we, we didn't stay at that peak. You, you didn't, you know, right. you're not, you don't have a three month supply of uh, paper towels in your cupboard probably today. Um, and, and those trends reversed and they kind of reverted to more historical median. So we went to the median shipping, not, not anything dramatic, but we overbuilt capacity to, to, to support an, uh, an abnormal uh, volume demand. So you have this, you know, you have anybody who could have a truck, you could became an instant billionaire, right? If you could commit a thing and you could drive the truck and take somebody's cargo shipment from a, from one point to another, you were in business and you're doing extremely well. And then that, you know, at the same time, the government stimulus, the low, super low interest rate, the financings, those, those things you picked for nearly nothing. Um, uh, in terms of financing costs, and those COVID leases are still in place. So we have a bit of a delayed effect of people exiting the industry, which is a normal thing in a down cycle. And yeah. it's prolonged because the cost of the equipment is a lot cheaper than ever before in the, in the history of economic cycles. So you have this prolonged exits, which have not rationalized the supply demand equation. Um, you have those very committed years infrastructure investment in terminals and expanding the infrastructure for handling ex um, exuberant amount of freight in, in this uh, in this country and that kind of makes it for a fairly miserable outcome for for those who may try to make a living in transportation do you think that there are things that we could have done to prevent what happened because it's it seems to me that it, it is a cycle, but at the same time, how could we have avoided it given what happened in the pandemic and everybody was stocking up and so on? How could we have avoided doing exactly the thing that occurred, which now leads to the recession in this industry? And I, I'd be also curious to see if you think that that's going to spread further to the rest of the economy, but how could we have avoided it? Or could we have? Um, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to convince people to hate making money. Uh, and that's, that's a tough thing because at the peak of the cycle, every incremental capacity, uh, you know, delivers extraordinary monetary benefits. So you would, you would have to ask for restraint and discipline that is, you it's know, not natural there. to us, <laughs> a natural to us as humans and definitely not part of the American, American, um, fabric which is obviously op opportunis opportunism and entrepreneurialism um so and it's there's a history of that every unprecedented uh, event if you go back in history tend to occur every six to seven years we have that unprecedented event of of a of a decline in the trough that 
uh, that one can fully expect. We like the smarter people. I mean, and that's that's sort of a, a South telling con. But you know, it, when in our business, we really reserved a lot of cash in 2020 and 2021, and I directed all of my management teams to just prepare for inevitable recession mm. and entering entering with a high you know high reserves of of cash helps you through the down cycle. People who have leveraged themselves to the tilt and um, and in the pursuit of of getting access to that capacity can deploy to um, earning act, uh, earning activities have found themselves you know disappointed and and at the point of you know difficulty or despair at times and many of them have since exited the, the industry or the business and um, altogether but um, it's not a it's not I don't think it's avoidable it's a cyclicality of commodity businesses. A lot of businesses go through cycles. Oil and gas is a violent cycle. Ocean shipping, transportation businesses of all kinds, all of them are extraordinarily uh, uh, linked to economic gravitas. And that just, you know, that just happens. The question is that can you make the landing as soft as possible? Well, because you cannot avoid not going down. Yeah, which is really... The, the wisdom and, and the thing that you have to do, we can't prevent it, but at the same time, we if we are wise, we can prepare for it. And that makes perfect sense um, because it's, it is one of those things that just too many people just run right into things and they do things, they just react. We have too many knee-jerk reactions without strategizing, and that's part of the problem. So what you did is is clearly the way to go. Um, and the hope is that you're predicting enough of the recession and the level of it that that you'll be able to survive it and it won't become too bad. Yeah, I mean, listen, people at the peak of the cycle have difficulty seeing the cliff. Um, they always try to believe that this time will be different and, um, and it won't end up in tears like every single time beforehand. At the same time, people at the bottom of the cycle can't sometimes pass, see past the doom and gloom of the misery of today. But, you know, as Rumi the poet says, this shall pass too. I yeah. Say, and it's just, you know, you can never predict. And I don't, you know, there's just, you know, all the even, you know, a broken clock is, is right twice a day, uh, which is one of my favorite sayings. And right. if you perpetually predict the negative, you one day you'll be right if you you know, a perpetual optimist, one day you'll be quoted that you had predicted it. But I don't think there's this ability to predict the timing and severity of these swings. What you can do is to do your absolute best to prepare for the cyclicality and inevitability of a of an economic cycle that impacts industries that are commodity industries and try not to believe your own headlines. That's uh that's <laughs> one of my favorite sayings to the things. Just when you, you have this kind of um you know exuberant uh confidence in your own ability but there's always a healthy check-in that is that is required and 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 i always tell the management team don't don't you know we're very good but we're not that good and never ever re believe in your own press releases yeah well one of my favorite sayings is don't worry about the things that you can't control focus on what you can and let the rest take care of itself and you can't control the recession concept or recessions necessarily but what you can control is how well you prepare for it and you think about it far enough in advance or sufficiently that you prepare as well as you can and that's all you can do. Yeah, well said. So um, I assume that right now rates are cheaper than they have been in the past and this is a good time to ship? It is a good time to ship. <laughs> it is a good time to ship, particularly from a, from a perspective of past you know yeah. years of 2020 21 22 um and um but you know you don't you know the rates are byproduct of capacity and, and demand right it's a, there's always there's there's the markets are very efficient when they find a market clearing price or rate uh, for any service the key is that you know what do we do like about the ltl industry that all the curious are disciplined so while everybody nobody will be reporting um record earnings this year uh the the, the 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 what we do provides an adequate and uh, return on capital to provide for continuity and sustainability of our enterprise well it sounds like 
that you and what you do um, with Roadrunner and I think in other places have built companies and made them successful. And, and I think the most important part about that is that you build good teams. How do you do that? You know, everybody wants to play on the winning team. I've learned that fairly, fairly often. If you want, um, you know, you could be not necessarily the easiest coach or um, not the kindest general manager of a sports team, but the players who want to join and come and play on the team if, you, if you're winning championships. And, um, and it's all about the creating the little victories and momentum and creating the positive momentum uh, because it, it kind of takes a life of its own. Um, and it's all about velocity of decision-making processes. These are sort of uh, things that when, when, I see, um, when I see organization crippled you know, by the paralysis, by analysis, and they kind of these sort of full of smartest people uh, in the world, but they just cannot make the right decision that they, they spend endless time uh, through you know, trying to model different outcomes. Um, you attract top people who believe in the ability to become very effective as leaders, as managers, by combining the intelligence, the talent, the respect for data and analytics, and they are empowered to make decisions and they are empowered to make a difference. The, 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 you know, even through my life, you know, I've seen how many changes and the generations that are entering the workforce today are very different in behaviors that even I was in. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the contrast is quite stark, but what it is very magnetizing to, uh, to them is the ability to be impactful and do something they truly believe in um, and do the right thing. And based upon um very objective analysis as opposed to uh you know do it because i say so or gut based decision making and and so forth so my teams my management teams evolved quite rapidly i've you know the last 14 15 years you know i've had about probably 90 percent rotation in my team as we continue to upgrade and so can people continue to find different paths or they're just not good uh, enough as as the caliber of challenges I take on increases, um, but you know I'm 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 thrilled to see so many incredibly young young folks on my team doing things that are just almost you know I could only describe as insp mm. inspiring to me. There's something to be said for energy, isn't there? Oh, energy is key, and and from the leadership perspective, you need you absolutely need credibility. So you need to act with integrity, authenticity. You need to win the the respect of the people by fighting alongside with them in the trenches, and you know, and being a very high energy leader, I think, is critical, particularly in an industry uh, as ours. Right? I I love the kinetic movement. I love the energy released by uh, by transport and moving and. Um, and um, and um, I lead the way that um, I would want to see the people around me behave, and I think that's critically important. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that people need to relate to you um, and to to leaders, because if if they can't relate, if they can't really feel like they're part of the team, then they never will be. And the leaders, the person, or the leaders are the people who need to make that happen. I agree. I think there are different industries that um, that 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 aspect that you just mentioned is extremely important. Logistics, absolutely. But there are different industries. Like mm -hmm. know, think about law firms or hospitals. They doctors don't need to be inspired by leadership. Lawyers need to be inspired by the management committee. They excellent professionals and and they operate within their own um you know scope of autonomy and they the phenomenal what they do in logistics it doesn't work you could be the most brilliant person in the room if you do not win the hearts and minds of your fellow teammates you're not going to get anything done and that is critical because if you and that's why logistics business particularly those who do extremely well have leaders 
who have, you know, extremely personable, personable with a very high degree of energy. They're not, you know, what you would have imagined in the past. And you can see in sort of even the, if you look at an S&P and stock performance and, and, and the shareholder value creation, you, those firms who have very passionate, uh, charismatic leadership teams tend to outperform dramatically the rest of the, uh, uh, the peer cohort. But even in a law firm, if it's a real firm, and I think that's the, the issue, if, if it wants to operate as an entity, even though lawyers have their own cases and so on, but if, if it really wants to operate as an entity and find ways for people to collaborate and work together or work with each other at least, then there's got to be some level of leadership in it. And it sometimes happens and then sometimes it doesn't. And I think that's true in, in a lot of industries. But the best companies are ones where there is a, a leader or leaders who can bring people together and, and make people all work toward whatever the common goals are. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the best part of your job? You know, the best part is seeing the people who have worked so hard, who've committed um, so much of the personal time and, and sacrifice over the years, um, come to work and you see that moment when there are sparks in their eyes, when they see mm -hmm. that their work matters and they're making a difference. And there's nothing more fulfilling because everybody wants to be you know on the winning team and you know in the history of roadrun which is obviously the most current one but every other business that i've had the privilege of of being at the helm of you the, when 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 people who make the companies start really feeling that they've made the difference and their contributions matter and they're being appreciated and the work shows there is no greater feeling in the world So what, what influences you? I mean, obviously you learn, um, you find ways to learn, um, and things need to, uh, probably influence you to, to get to think the way you do. What are the things that influence you in the world other than Acme and the Wiley Coyote? Um, you know, this is, I, I've, I've gone through my share of role models and mentors and, you know, I'm profoundly grateful for the influence they've had on shaping the character of a person that I am and, and the business person that uh, I've become. And, and there were many, um, mm -hmm. right now it's really sort of, you know, as you kind of, as I'm, you know, becoming more mature, um, it's really kind of creating legacy and living legacy, um, and doing that through passing the, the proverbial baton to the new generations and seeing people step up um, and grow and become more confident in their abilities and truly believe in themselves, that's really is, is, is tremendous. Um, and I think that's, you know, as, you know, the, you know, the, the, my twenties and thirties and soon the forties will be over. Um, the next, the next decade in my life will, effectively about creating the living legacy. And that's probably the most powerful uh, influence uh, in my life. One of the things that I've learned came from being a member of the largest consumer organization of blind people, the National Federation of the Blind. And the president of the federation years and years and years ago started organizing what he called leadership seminars. And that's continued with later presidents. But one of the things that the president said, uh, well, actually a question that he asked, I remember it clearly, it was on Saturday night of the seminar, is what is the most important thing that the president of the organization can and should be doing? And his response after hearing what other people said is, the most important thing I think the president has to do is to be looking for his successor. Um, because there will become a time that he doesn't get to be president anymore. And if the organization is going to continue, then the president needs to be the one to find the person who can take over and do what needs to be done going forward. What do you think about that? I think it's very profound. I yeah. think it's critical. I, I've, you know, through my, through my adventure in logistics, you know, I've been, uh, 
at the helm of, you know, now at the helm of eighth and ninth organization. Um, and um, I've done, um, I've executed seven exits and every single time that I left, um, what was left behind was a fully sustainable management team that could take, um, they would take the operation to the new the new level but it would be their their story it wouldn't be mine anymore right and it's it's tough it's tough because first you first there's we humans and we develop emotional connectivity if we healthy humans we obviously we relate relate to fellow humans and um, and we we like what we do and we tend to touched so it's difficult to let go Second of all, particularly when things are going well, there's, you know, we tend to develop this unimpeachable view of self intellect and supremacy and irreplaceability, which is completely nonsensical, but it is human. And I've maintained a very healthy discipline of not staying at the helm of any organization for more than three, four years. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, that's, that's very healthy. And I think at any given time, you, you have to create, because to be honest, if, especially in today's today's society if people do not see the path forward if they think that their abilities uh, will not be recognized within the meritocracy uh, of the organizational dynamics they will leave and mm -hmm. the competition for talent is fierce mm -hmm. and it's not a defensive play but it makes organization better there are I've seen a lot of executives trying to hang on to the spots for decades. And, and to be honest, all they've accomplished, I think, is stymied the, the potential that organization could have had. Doesn't mean the businesses are not performing, but I think the business could have gone um, a lot further. And, uh, but it's tough. It's difficult, right? We don't want to see, we don't want to see ourselves as impediments to growth. Who wants to think of themselves like that? It's, yeah. uh, I think, but I think it's a very healthy habit. As much as I'm a firm believer in term limits in in in, in certain uh, government spheres, I'm a strong believer in term limits at the helm of uh, commercial organizations. And and I've lived by by example of that, having you know, having exited seven times already. So my average tenure is just under you know just about two and three years. Well, and. And obviously, you leave when you know that you've been able to put together a team, um, and even possibly including a person at the top of the team who can take over and continue the growth or whatever it is that the organization needs, which is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, on a personal note, what do you do when you're not being CEO or chair of the board? What kind of hobbies or pastimes and other things like that do you do to be a little bit more frivolous in the world? So my absolute thing in the world is kiteboarding, um, which I don't get to do enough, uh -huh. um, but it is aspirational. Uh, kiteboarding and sailing, these are the most uh, relaxing things I can ever envision doing in my life. And it's been quite some time since I, um, uh, since I've sailed, and it's been quite some time since I kiteboarded. So, uh like i'm i'm targeting you know the end of this year to maybe get at least a few weekends uh out in the ocean as long as the sharks leave you alone well if you outrun them <laughs> well there, there's that that's fair okay well chris i want to thank you for taking so much time to be here um i hope that you've enjoyed it and had fun i certainly have learned a lot which is what i always like to do and I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us and making this, a, I think, a relevant and memorable podcast for people to hear. I could absolutely and Laurel joke myself. And thank you so much for inviting me and having me on your show. Thanks very much for listening to Unstoppable Mindset. Uh, we hope that wherever you're listening, you'll give us a five-star rating. We value that very highly. If you want to comment on this podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibe.com, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. You can also go hear other podcasts, anywhere podcasts are available, especially you could go to www.michaelhingson, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com slash podcast. But wherever you listen to us, please give us a five-star rating. We value that very highly. And 
We hope that you'll come back and visit with us again next time on Unstoppable Mindset.